Hello, my friends. Welcome to my corner. My experience of the work of Naguib Mahfouz began many, many years ago when I decided to read at least one book by every winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. I started with this book right here, The Day the Leader Was Killed. And that was primarily because this is the book that I found at my local bookstore when I decided to start this project. I, actually, Naguib Mahfouz was one of the first authors that I read as part of that adventure. So this was the one that I found. And I do want to recommend this book to you. It's a very slim volume and it's a really, really nice multi-perspective novella. I have also read a collection of short stories by him titled The Seventh Heaven. This is a collection of supernatural short stories. So I was really attracted to this volume because of that, because of the supernatural theme that uh, he explores throughout these stories. Now, I would be lying to you if I told you that I remember the details about the stories that I read, but I do remember enjoying these tales very much. So that's another volume that I would recommend to you. About five years ago, I read The Thief and the Dogs, and of the books that I have read by Mafuz so far, this has been my favorite. And then it was three months ago that I finally read the one that I had been wanting to read for a very long time, which is, of course, Midak Ali. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you about these two. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Midak Ali and a little bit about The Thief and the Dogs. So why don't we explore it? these books. We're going to start, of course, with Midak Ali, which is um, Naguib Mahfouz's most famous uh, novel, and uh, it was published in 1947. I would say, if I had to put it simply, I would say that Midak Ali is about the lives of people who live in Cairo and who live in the same street. So we have a kind of a microcosm right here, and there are several characters in this novel whose paths intersect at many points in the narrative. But of course, you know, inevitably, some of these characters are going to receive more attention than others. And this is an urban novel, and for that reason, it reminds me of Camilo José Cela's La Colmena, a novel that does with Madrid what uh, Midak Ali does with Cairo, and a novel also that I'm going to be telling you about in a future video, hopefully, relatively soon at least. So as I said, we had a street here that is presented to us as a microcosm, so there are many, many characters. And if you ask me, okay, Jorge, how would you describe the characters of Midak Ali? I would respond to borrow a phrase from Nietzsche, from one of his titles. I would say that these characters are human all too human. This is a novel of humanistic depth, I would say. And you can take these characters and almost match them to their corresponding deadly sin. Okay, if you take the seven deadly sins and, and you start saying, you know, this character matches with this sin and this character matches with this other one, and sometimes you can take one character and match them with more than one deadly sin. But I would say that even though we have several characters with many, many problems, I think there is one character, and most readers of the novel would probably agree with me, who emerges as a protagonist, I would say, and that is the character of Hamida. Okay. She really is the one that I would focus on when I read this book, so I wanted to start telling you a little bit more about her and then looking at the other characters that are present in the novel. So Hamida is materialistic, she is greedy, she is envious, and she dreams of leaving Midak Ali. She's not really happy with the situation right there that she has, so she thinks that maybe if she emigrates and she leaves this awful place, place that she considers awful, uh, things will go well for her and all her problems will be over. There's Abbas, the barber, who is in love with her. He also dreams of leaving and he has a friend by the name of Hussein Kirsha. He also dreams of leaving behind Midak Ali. So you see a pattern right here. All of these characters who are dissatisfied with their situation in life and they think that maybe if they leave this place behind they will be able to have a better experience in their lives. And there is also someone else who wants Hamida. So as I, as I told you, there's Abbas the barber. He is in love with her. But then there's a character by the name of Salim Alwan, who, unlike Abbas, has a lot of money. And Hamida really likes that. So he is after Hamida. We can debate on to whether this is love or not. But uh, there's another character to complicate things for us. You're going to notice if you read Midak Ali that at the midpoint of the novel there is a political thread that is introduced because elections are held. And at a political rally it is that Hamida is going to encounter another character who is going to change her life. And that is the character of Ibrahim 
Farage. So you can see there are many men uh, who are intersecting in the fact that they are interested in Hamida. Other than that, let's not forget Hamida's mother, Um Hamida, who is a matchmaker. And she has promised Mrs. Afifi that she will find a match for her. Mrs. Afifi is an unappealing character who is desperate to get married again even though she pretends that she is not interested in men anymore she really is and that's why she talks to Um Hamida to see if she can find a match for her so that she can finally get married again and that's one of the many threads of the plot of Midak Ali that uh, we follow and that keep us interested as readers however I would say it is not really all about Hamida even though she seems to be at the center of the narrative here there's another central character to the novel and that is Kirsha the cafe owner he is basically central because the cafe is the place where most of the action takes place and one of those many places in, at which the characters lives intersect that's another reason why i was reminded of camilo jose Sela's la colmena or the hive because there is also a cafe there in that novel that is central to the action so kirsha is devoted to and i would say maybe even consumed by his two vices which are hashish and boys, okay? So as I was saying before, you can really match these characters to their corresponding uh, deadly sin. And Kirsha's son, as I told you before, is also uh, friends with Abbas, who is in love with Hamida. So you can see how all of these characters' destinies are so closely woven together and intertwined. This is a really well-constructed novel and I think you're really gonna enjoy that. If you enjoy novels where you can tell that the author and the narrator you know is really paying attention to all of these threads, that the author actually thought about all of these connections that exist, then you're really gonna enjoy Midak Ali. There are many more characters, okay? Uh, too many to mention, really. We could mention Dr. Bushi, we could mention Uncle Camille. We could also mention Saita, who is a really dark character. He is uh, sadistic and he turns people into beggars. And he is after a bakeress by the name of Husniya, who, by the way, likes to beat her husband, Jada. So you see, <laughs> these two, Husniya and Saita, are really made for each other because they are both very sadistic. But my point here is that there are many, many lives that make up Midak Ali and that is one of the reasons why we tend to look for protagonists also but be aware that it's not all about those important characters that have important or you know maybe very obvious stories to them there are also minor characters just as you can find in real life so we have talked about the premise or a little bit about the quote-unquote plot about the characters let's look a little bit at themes right here if you ask me, I would say that the main theme of Midak Ali is that nobody's perfect. And I am only uh, slightly joking. I, I am joking, but not really uh, in this case. This is a realist novel, and it is also, as I said before, a deeply humanist novel. And Mafuz, what he does is he writes about these characters who are flawed, but he does that in such a way that we can actually sympathize with them, because as a narrator, he has a lot of compassion and a lot of understanding for these characters. He understands their human nature and their frailty as human beings. So uh, even though these characters are self-destructive and we can really, really see that, there's also a voice of wisdom in this novel. And that belongs to a character that I have not mentioned uh, so far. His name is Sheik Darwish. He is a poet, he is a wise old man kind of figure, and maybe even a wise old madman. Because you know how it is, when you have a voice of wisdom uh, among characters who are not really wise and who are maybe, you know, just caught up in their, in their problems and, and their sins or their frailty in, in this case, the person who has the voice of wisdom seems to be completely crazy, right? It's like that myth of Cassandra, the, the person who was doomed to prophesy and nobody would believe her, right? So I associate the figure of Sheik Darwish uh, with the figure of Cassandra because of that. Another theme I was thinking that people have associated with Midak Ali is the clash between tradition on the one hand and modernity on the other, which makes perfect sense. And one thing to keep in mind as you read this novel is that the war is there, the World War II, right? It's right there in the background throughout the novel because the action takes place uh, during that time. So uh, that's another way in which this society is forced to come to terms with modernity, a very traditional society that is basically, you know, pushed into uh, modern times. Another theme that critics have pointed out in Midak Ali is the theme of poverty. 
And one thing that I wanted to ask you is, if you do decide to read Midak Ali, as a way of maybe giving a little bit more depth to the reading experience, one question that you could ask yourself is, how does poverty decide or maybe influence the actions that these characters take, okay, their decisions? So are they determined by poverty or are they really free characters who just get caught up in their own problems because of their own poor decisions? That is one key question when you read uh, this novel. So let me share with you some conclusions about this uh, text before we move on to the next one. I think that Midak Ali is a really sad story, but it is also unforgettable. As I read it, I was just overwhelmed almost by these sad stories. And one thing that I like about it is that I would say it is both local and universal. Okay, And this is something that actually has something to do directly with the citation of the Nobel Committee when they decided to award the prize to Naguib Mahfouz, and I wanted to share that with you. So uh, Naguib Mahfouz won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1988, and uh, they decided to award this prize to him, quote, who, through works rich in nuance, now clear-sightedly realistic, now evocatively ambiguous, has formed an Arabian narrative art that applies to all mankind. So as I was saying, you know, this idea that he is both very local and very universal, which can be applied to many um, Nobel laureates, so that is definitely there. Now, as you may know, Naguib Mahfouz's Midak Ali was adapted into film. Of course, there is an Egyptian film. But then, uh, many years later, in the 90s, it was adapted into a film titled El Callejón de los Milagros which takes place in a Mexican setting because the film is Mexican. It's the first major role of Salma Hayek and this film was directed by Jorge Fons. So the film uh, has a different structure, okay? They decided to focus on the role of Kirsha, the cafe owner, who is named Don Rutilio in the movie. Then we have a second story that focuses, of course, on Hamida, or Alma, as she is known in the movie, and this is the character, of course, that Salma Hayek plays. And then for a third story right there, we have Mrs. Afifi, who in the movie is known as Susanita. So these three stories are intertwined, and they make up this film, El Callejón de los Milagros. So because we have that structure of the three stories, I was thinking that maybe this film sort of prefigures in its structure that great film by Alejandro González Iñarri to Amores Perros, right? Because you also have that idea of three stories that are very close together and that show you sometimes the same event from different perspectives. So I would say the structure is not as good as that of Amores Perros, but it definitely kind of looks forward to that film. The movie works very well, and once again, to reaffirm something that I said before, it really attests to the universality of Mahfouz's work, especially of Midak Ali, because you can really take this story from Egypt to Mexico in modern times, right? Not in World War II, and it just works perfectly well. So if you're new to Mahfouz and you want to start someplace, right? Midak Ali really is a very good place to start and a great introduction to his work. So now that we have talked about Midak Ali, let's look at the other novel that I have for you, which is The Thief and the Dogs. And I lost it. Here it is. So this is the one that we're going to be uh, talking about now. So I would say that if Midak Ali is a little bit of a panoramic uh, work, because we have the lives of many characters presented to us, The Thief and the Dogs, on the other hand, is a lot more focused. We have one main character that we are going to be focusing on, but there are also, of course, secondary characters. Now, because we have less characters, we get to know them much more in depth than we do the characters of Midak Ali. And as I was reading this, or looking at it again after reading it a few years ago, I was thinking, The Thief and the Dogs is really as if we got the chance to zoom in on one of the lives of the characters of Midak Ali. So it really goes for that focus, right? That is the key word when discussing this novel. So if you prefer that kind of approach to a more panoramic or a more collective character, then I would say uh, The Thief and the Dogs is probably the text for you. This is a psychological, introspective, impressionistic story punctuated by little sequences of stream of consciousness. So I really like that, okay? It's a story of betrayal and revenge also. So we have really important themes, really heavy themes right here. And another thing that attracted me to The Thief and the Dogs is that it is much more existentialist 
than Midak Ali for obvious reasons uh, also because we really get the chance to focus on the individual and that just makes for a better approach when it when, when it comes to you know uh, writing an existentialist uh, type of story so let me share with you some quick details about the plot here so as the story begins we have Said Maran our character our hero slash anti-hero who is getting out of prison after serving a four-year sentence so just because of that just because of the premise of course I could not help thinking of um, Berlin Alexanderplatz, that, that novel that I talked about many uh, months ago, a couple of years ago, so if you want to check out my video on that, uh, that's definitely an option. But I also thought of another novel that begins with a similar premise, which is R.K. Narayan's The Guide. Okay, we have these stories about people who are just out of prison and trying to readjust themselves to society once again. So, in this case, uh, we have the character of Said, right, back to, to this novel. And his issue is this, his wife, uh, Nabawiya, has just remarried and his daughter does not recognize him anymore. And by the way, Nabawiya has married the guy who used to be Said's partner in crime. And that's not all. It was these two people, Nabawiya and his former partner in crime, who actually turned Said over to the police. That's a pretty awkward situation in my book. I mean, I'm pretty sure you agree. So we have an awful situation. And that's not even all there is to it, because Said meets a man by the name of Rauf Ilwan, who used to be somebody very close to him. He's a revolutionary journalist who Said regarded as a hero before he went into prison. And this guy is now living a life of luxury. So you can see the awful situation that he finds himself in. He's just disappointed, to, to say the least. It seems that everybody has sold out around him after these four years that he has spent in prison. So what he decides to do is to take justice into his own hands. As I told you before, this is a story of bitterness and uh, revenge. At one point, fate leads him to an old love interest, the prostitute Noor, who still has feelings for him. Okay, notice the contrast here. We have, on the one hand, the wife or the ex-wife, in this case, Nabawiya, and on the other hand, we have the figure of the prostitute, Noor. So, we can compare those two uh, images of, of women. But anyway, going back to the plot, at one point, uh, Said makes a fatal mistake, and that is when his life changes in irrevocable ways. Let me share something with you about the mode of this novel and some connections with other, other literary texts. So The Thief and the Dogs is fast-paced and philosophical, which is a really, really nice combination to have because you get the suspense of a man-on-the-run narrative with the ruminations of an existential criminal that has much in common with Dostoevsky's Raskolnikov and also with Camus' Meursault. So we have some great anti-heroes of literature here that have connections with Said. And because we are presented Said's, Said's thoughts directly, it is very easy to sympathize with him, even if you condemn his actions. And given what we know about Said, it, it is just almost impossible not to feel sorry for him. That's another thing that I like about this character. He's very complex. And I would say the problem with him is that, that he has a tragic flaw, and that would be his inability to understand that in life, you know, sometimes good people suffer, and bad people prosper. That's just the way it is, this side of paradise, you know? So ultimate justice, in other words, is really not something of this world. And Said has really a very difficult time accepting that. And that is, I would call it his uh, tragic flaw. I've read somewhere that The Thief and the Dogs is uh, one of the favorites among Nagib Mahfouz's fans. And I, I think, you know, I, I can totally believe that because there's just something about these existential criminals, isn't it? I, I mean, it, it's just a, characters like Raskolnikov, like Meursault. And I also would need to mention here a great character from a literary uh, novella from Argentina, Juan Pablo Castel from uh, Sabatos El Tunel, which I have also talked about, so you can also check out that video if you want to know more about him. These characters uh, differ from each other greatly. Okay, Raskolnikov, uh, Murso, Juan Pablo Castel, Said. But they have one thing in common, and that is the fact that the narrators, sometimes themselves, right, or the authors who choose to share their stories with us, present them in an ambiguous way. So they are not easy to condemn or to absolve. And that is one of the main points of uh, this type of literature. It's just very dark, okay? And you cannot just decide, okay, this guy is guilty or he is not guilty. These are very complex human beings, and that is part of the point. So I would say that of all of these characters that I have mentioned, Mafusa Said is really one of the easiest to sympathize with, because you can really tell that he is a victim. 
there are so many awful things going on around him, you know? So it's just really, really easy to, to feel for this guy, even, as I said before, if you condemn his actions. A couple of thoughts on revenge, okay? Uh, Said is not justified. The Thief and the Dogs is really, in one of the ways that you can read it, a cautionary tale against the futility and against the dangers of revenge. Okay, if the problem is injustice, this is what the novel is suggesting. Just a, a misguided notion of justice is only going to complicate things and is only going to perpetuate this vicious cycle of revenge and violence. So, to me as a reader, what I was thinking as I read this novel is that, in a way, one of the many messages of The Thief and the Dogs is the old idea that an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. So, bottom line about these two books by Nagid Mafuz. Both Midak Ali and uh, The Thief and the Dogs just attest to the great scope of this author and this narrator, this storyteller. Okay, He is just as good at giving life to a small community as he is at exploring the intricacies of the human mind. That's one thing that I love about him, that he can do both of these things very well. I personally was touched more by the thief and the dogs, okay, and this is a totally personal thing, but what I like about it is the idea that it focuses on one character and that it is able in that way to explore more existentialist themes. But I would say that both novels present really uh, compelling and thought-provoking stories. So if you are new to Mafus once again, and if you choose one of these two novels to start your journey, you really can't go wrong. Either one of these novels is really, really good. And the other books that I told you about are also very good reading experiences that you can enjoy. There are many books by Mafus that I want to read. He's a very prolific uh, author. I have the first volume of the Cairo trilogy at my office, um, so, you know, someday probably I'm going to start on that, but, you know, it, it requires some time, so I need to have some time to devote to that. I also have in a box uh, at a storage the novel Arabian Days and Nights, but for that one I was thinking, you know, before I read that, I would like to read the 1001 Nights, and what are the chances that I'm going to have time to read the 1001 Nights? Well, uh, last year it happened. I read the 1001 Nights, so I would now need to go to uh, that storage and uh, pick up that book. And then there's another book uh, by him that I am really, really interested in, that I was um, looking at at the library the other day, and it is this one right here. I got it from the library couple of days ago. It's titled The Dreams, okay, and it brings together two books in which um, he shares with us these little poetic dreamlike vignettes that are just amazing. At first, when I was looking at this, I thought these were actual dreams, and I am fascinated by that, that idea of uh, a diary of dreams, like Natsume Soseki's Ten Nights, Ten Nights Dreaming, but these are not really dreams. They are pretty much flash fiction, but they have that dreamlike atmosphere and quality to them. So that's another book by him that I look forward to reading. Just so you know, at first, when he started publishing, he was writing historical novels and historical short stories. So he has novels and short stories based on the lives of ancient Egyptians, which I think is just fantastic and, and I'm really, really interested in that. So, you know, he wrote a lot and there are many books by him that are considered to be classics. So this is an amazing author that I would really like to read more by. So we'll see uh, what my next uh, choice is in terms of continuing this uh, reading journey with Nagib Mahfouz. Do you have any questions, comments, recommendations, recipes? Just let me know. You know where to find me. And I'm always here listening. So those were my two cents on Midak Ali and the Thief and the Dogs by uh, Nagib Mafus. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.